God is good. He's, he's with us this morning. If you're a believer, he dwells in you. I love that. You know, Old Testament saints, uh, he would come upon them and then depart from them. Uh, yet we're so blessed that when we're, we trust Christ, he sends that spirit into our heart, crying, Daddy, Daddy, Abba, Father. And he dwells with us forever. I love that. Uh, aren't you thankful for Junior Church in nursery? I saw the kids and I thought, boy, all that excitement, they have to go up there and bottle that and control that. And I thought one of these days, one kid's going to run headlong into one of these pews and, and, and get a big old knot on its head. And uh, we should just have the seniors take up the dollar offerings for special causes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Could you see that? We run. <laughs> uh, I, I, I did hear about a pastor who uh, after being in ministry, he had a secret vice. He, he had a drinking problem, and he had a cabinet full of liquor. So he said to the church, uh, I'm going to pour all my liquor in the river and all my, uh, you know, substances and all that and get, it, get rid of all of it, and uh, you can come pour yours in. So the music director got up and led in this song, Shall We Gather by the River? <laughs> uh, Wednesday night, we'll be looking at the third miracle. So we're studying the miracles. If you'd like to be there, we are in the fellowship hall. Uh, I was kind of startled. Uh, David Crosby of um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash uh, said, heaven is overrated, and the next day he died. It's kind of scary. Isn't it? But think of all the people that take the Lord's name in vain all the way up to the point of death. I was thinking about another rock group. Um, oh, I can't think of it. Uh, but anyway... Uh, they had a song that I can't get no satisfaction and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And you think of Madonna being on national TV saying there's just something missing here. And Dennis Rodman said I, I, there's, there's an emptiness inside of me. Here are people with everything the world has to offer yet they're empty because the answer is in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 8 today, and uh, I don't want to be too redundant as we go through the, the, the miracles uh, or the plagues, we, we call them in the Old Testament, uh, some of it's redundant material, so I'll kind of change things up from time to time, maybe in the middle of the uh, nine plagues, maybe we'll go over into the epistles uh, uh, for a, a study, but uh, just don't want you to uh, fall asleep while I'm falling asleep on the job. You shouldn't fall asleep in the pew, you know. I'm joking, but uh, we're looking at lice today. And uh, the Hebrew word means to fasten, something to fasten. So we believe this was a parasite here, and, and we're certain it was a parasite, very small, because it would be mixed in with the dust of the earth, and we think of all the parasites. Uh, one person, you know, one person renders it gnats. Uh, uh, others have different rendering of it. But it, you know, lice are a parasite, and that's what we have in the text. Fleas. The flea. I, I studied parasites. Isn't that something to study? The little flea's legs fill up with resin, and he jumps a hundred times his his size. That's like a person jumping over the Empire State Building. The little creature with a hard little shell that can survive below freezing temperatures. Amazing creature, yet we hate them because they get on our pets. Uh, well, they hated whatever it was, these lice, because they were all over the Israelites, the Egyptians, and even the animals here. But um, mites and gnats, sand fleas, uh, lice, all these things are really a, an annoyance. And if you get to heaven, you're going to say, God, what about mosquitoes and all these other critters? And I don't know what the answer will be, but he created everything. And uh, we know they're good food for the birds, but uh, they're annoying to us. Uh, we know that uh, Israel was often plagued by pestilence. As you study their history, God would send a plague of locusts in to get their attention, a way to chastise them. And uh, we know fleas wiped out a fourth of Europe's population with the bubonic plague. So these little creatures aren't fun. Parasites are very annoying. We went down to Branson a few years ago, and my son, we didn't have enough room in our timeshare, so he said, I'll get a cheap motel real close by, and then we'll spend the day here anyway. And he got a cheap motel, and it had bed bugs. <laughs> and, uh, 
Uh, that was interesting, you know, uh, bed bugs, and that can't be good for the hotel's reputation. But uh, we all have had an experience or two with a parasite, I'm certain. Uh, let's read chapter 8, verses 16 to 19. If you have that, stand. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became as lice in man, and in beast. And the dust of all the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. God bless us as we take a look in the book for a walk in the world. Lord, we all need something today. We're here because we know that your word feeds us. And we know the Holy Spirit inside us lets us know what's, what's wrong in our life, what's right in our life. Uh, he knows when we're discouraged, when we're struggling. And Lord, I just pray that you'll meet each and every need. I'm not going to try to be the Holy Spirit and mention everybody's problems, Lord. But the Holy Spirit knows every individual heart today. And I pray those needs will be met. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Years ago when I first came down here uh, and I got married and we bought some land up near Prentice Cooper State Park and we had a little third of an acre that was on the river. Now you couldn't build on that and you couldn't put plumbing in and everything like that there. But I thought, well, it'd be nice to maybe put a little dock, a dock on the bank and I could drop it into the water. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had a machete from Panama and in Central America when we were missionaries there in the military. And, and I, I, I um, went out there with that machete. And I had shorts on and I pulled my shirt off and I went in that thick, dense, uh, you know, forest or whatever. And I began to cut, um, you know, a path. And I mean, I was just in this stuff over my head. I was just soaking wet with sweat. But I got the job done. And I got back in my car, and as I drove home, I began to itch. I mean, everything itched. I looked down. My chest was bright red. My arms were red. My legs were red. I went immediately to a doctor, and uh, it was a, a, day, a weekday, and I went to a, a clinic, and I walked in all sweaty. I mean, you know, it's just embarrassed. I put my shirt back on, and I was just miserable. And I went back, and the doctor said, well, take your shirt off. And, you know, I took everything off. And he said, what on earth has happened to you? I said, I don't know. He said, those are chiggers. He said, you have a million chigger bites or more. He said, every inch of your body, my back, to hear all chiggers. And my legs, and I had to put grease all over my body and my legs and walk around like this for a day or two till they suffocated. I learned about chiggers <laughs> and parasites and... Uh, I was just uh, overwhelmed with itching, and I thought, that was a miserable experience. So I know about that, and you know about that, and you had an experience you could share with a parasite or two, whether it be ticks, the, the bigger kind, or whatever. Um, they're all miserable. But we, we notice here, let's pick up in verse 16. We notice here, as stated earlier, the word smite, we talked about that being the same as Isaiah 53, 4. He doesn't just speak, he actually smites the ground, the dust, and all these lice uh, begin to take over. And then verse 17, he took his rod. Remember the rod we talked about would end up in the Ark of the Covenant. That old hard piece of wood would begin to bud again as a type of the resurrection. And let me pause and say this because I had to tell my preacher boys this when I taught. I said, guys, types are wonderful, numerology is wonderful, and all these things are great. And there's a lot of great types. The Corinthians says the Old Testament is full of types for us. But never take a type and change the context and the clear meaning in Scripture. And, uh, and so we have to be careful. But certainly uh, the striking of the rod, we see it in the rock in the wilderness. We see that as a type of Jesus Christ and several other types we see. And the rod budding would certainly be a type of the resurrection. 
But we know everyone's affected here. The animals, the people, the Israelites, the Egyptians. Now the last seven plagues only seem to affect the Egyptians. Especially the tenth plague. And not the Jews. But here, uh, I just thought I would talk about something today that could be practical. And I've sort of uh, entitled this, uh, Little Things That Can Make a Difference. You know, in life, they say more marriages end because of little things. People just can't get along. They're fighting over money or whatever. And, and we know that little things really annoy us. I hate a certain traffic light. I go down Moore Road to the terrace by the uh, OLPH, the Catholic school there, and I sit there and I think, this is the longest light. I want to get to work. And I'm impatient. And those little things in life. Think about all the little things that annoy you in life. Now, I'm wrong for being impatient. But there are so many little things that can really set us back. I mean, it's very annoying just to, to iron a shirt and get a phone call and you leave the iron on the shirt while you take the phone call and you don't have a shirt anymore. You know, unless you want to wear a holy shirt. It is Sunday. Maybe that would pass. But we, we do things like that. I think I've only done that once in my life. But we do do things like that. And they're very annoying. You know, I've said before, when you're down to the last piece of bread, you burn your toast. <laughs> it's just the way life is sometimes. And we can get so bogged down. We talked recently about the little fox that chews the vines and spoils the grapes. We talked recently about, you know, the tongue being a little thing but full of iniquity. Think of uh, uh, those with little faith. There's, there's the little horn of Daniel 7, and that's not anything little. That's the Antichrist. And then in chapter 8 would be Antioch Epiphany is another little horn. But a little leaven ruineth the whole, haven't we pointed out in the times past when talking about leaven, if you have a little piece of blue mold on your bread, you get it off, don't you? Otherwise, the next day, the bread will be covered in mold or the next couple of days. Little things really make a difference. And we're going to talk later about some little things in your life that maybe you need to work on so you can be a better person in the world. I think about a lot of positive little things in Scripture. In chapter 30 of Proverbs, it talks about little things. It talks about the ant, that hard little industrious worker. It talks about a spider. Isn't it amazing to watch a spider? Have you ever just paused long enough to watch part of God's nature, something God created? Now, the world would say Mother Nature. I say it's Father God. You know, but God designed that little critter. You're watching him spin that web, and you're just shocked at it. And we can't repeat the material exactly the way the spider can make that sticky stuff that'll trap that insect and totally control him. But little things in God's creation. I think about little children who oftentimes have big faith. Maybe you know that. There's been times at our table praying and reading our Kings for Kids. My mother um, was uh, related to Henry Vanderloop, one of the writers on the Daily Bread staff. And my dad's mom was a Dahan. And so we are well connected with the Daily Bread. What a great thing that was, and it still is. And, and we know that uh, we would get keys for kids from that organization. And we'd read them down in, in uh, the mission field when we had devotions with our kids. And, and we'd talk about things. And then maybe we'd sometimes, uh, you know, kind of, uh, fall into talking about a problem or finances or a church. And, of course, one of my boys would say, well, we just need to pray about it. God will take care of that. And I was always amazed at their faith, these little guys, these little girls. I don't have a little girl at that time. But the faith of a child. And little things, or little, little children with big faith. Little Zacchaeus who climbed up the sycamore tree. You ever think about him? In a, in a world where you're half the size of everyone else. And uh, no doubt he was small because the average Jewish man in that day, they believed to be five, six. So he was pretty small. And yet he was a big, ended up being a big man. Little fish in Matthew 15. We believe those are sardines and little barley loaves, just tiny loaves. I heard someone on the radio say, well, that boy brought a big lunch enough to feed a lot of people, uh, some, you know, loaves of bread and, and two-pound fish. And I thought, where is that guy getting his information? We believe they were little smelt-like sized fish or sardines, just enough for that boy to go all day and hear Jesus. But we know the little oil of Elijah 
that little bitty old oil, enough to just make a cake uh, for one person. And yet, little is much when God is in it. And I'll tell you, in our lives, the little things that we can do which will make a difference in the lives of others and the little things in our lives that hinder us from being what we ought to be, those little vices, those little things. Um, I'm naturally a, a half, half empty guy. I can be very negative and cynical and critical. It's a battle for me to work on that. And years ago, I was, uh, I was teasing my nephew. He's a college basketball player. And I said something kind of demeaning about uh, his, his basketball skills. And he was a very good player he, for the university he played for at Michigan, Michigan Tech. He actually is the highest three-point shooting percentage of anybody ever in the school for a season. And so he was really good, but I teased him. And he said, why do you do that? This is a long time ago. I was 35, maybe 40, I don't remember. And I got in my car and I drove home, and it's a long drive from Michigan to Chattanooga. And that bothered me the whole way home. And I said, I need to make a little change in my life. Be more sincere not sarcastic, and be more uplifting. And so I really have worked on that. Over the years, I've done way better. I'll, I'll tell people nice things now instead of sarcastically saying something. And that little change has actually changed me and changed other people. Now, that's a, a small illustration in my life, but you know in your life, as the Spirit speaks to you this morning, that you could make a little change or two, right? Because there's a little something there that hinders your walk or, or something there that you could do better and maybe you do well in all areas. You're one of those rare Christians that excels in every area. Uh, you know, Paul said, I, I speak with more tongues than, the, than you all. He knew all these languages. I, I wish I could say I could exercise all the gifts regularly, but I'm not gifted in all the areas of gifts, whether you believe there's 12 or 16 or whatever. We all have gifts, but most of us have maybe one or two. I'm sure there are people with more. I'm not one of those guys. Maybe you are, and maybe you're multi-talented, and you have just a great personality. But I just doubt that anyone's really got it all together because we're all dysfunctional, broken people. It's hard for us to admit. In my home, we always thought about other people who were different than us as being dysfunctional. But there were people who thought we were dysfunctional. My mom would go out on the back porch at 5.45 and blow a whistle. I mean, all seven of us, no matter where we were, we'd run home for supper. Now that to others, what? Your mom blows that whistle? Don't you just go home on time? Well, when you have ADD like I do, and yeah, I struggle to listen even today. It's hard for me to concentrate on time. And so my mom blew a whistle, we all ran home. I remember at, after football practice, I'd have to go straight home if I wanted to eat. My mom didn't ever keep leftovers. My dad didn't want her to keep leftovers. If we didn't get there to eat, we missed our supper, and everything's gone when you have nine people around a table. And uh, it was my big brothers and my dad eating it all. Uh, no, I'm joking. I ate as much as them. But, uh, you know, those little things and the little oddness that we all have, to, I think, don't think those are things are strange. We had some odd things in our family, and I learned when I got married, not everything in all families were the same as it were in our house. You know, uh, I remember the one shower for the nine people. Uh, and I was told if I wanted a bath, it had to be Saturday night. Because Sunday morning, the, the four girls and mom would get in, and the guys had to be out of the way. But little things can be annoying. I thought, now I've got all these bathrooms. My kids have moved out. I don't have to get annoyed over a little thing. I got a bathroom anywhere I want. <laughs> things have changed. But we all experience little challenges in life, and little things matter. Now pick up in verse 18. It says here, And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and beast, uh, and upon beast. They could not. They could not because God would not. God decides here to show his, his all power, his omnipotence, excuse me. I have to struggle to say that one. But God shows his power here. Now, he had let them do some of those things. Here he doesn't let it happen. 
Again, remember 7-4, the purpose of these is to show people he's the one and only true God. So he doesn't allow them to repeat this. With their magic, their enchantments, they could not do it because God would not let them. And then in verse 14, they said something interesting. And I've read so much on this. Different scholars say different things. Uh, the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. One writer said they're just trying to ignore the name of Yahweh. I don't know about that. I can't read that into the text. But they recognized something here, and they said to Pharaoh, we can't do this. This is the finger of God. We call this anthropomorphism. What is that, Pastor? Well, anthro is our word anthropology. You know that. But it's when we, we um, describe God with human parts and so forth. In other words, God's a spirit. But we see in Scripture his ear can hear. His eye can see, we see his arm, the arm of the Lord can save, we see his hand. Here, a mention of his finger, the finger of God. Remember in Daniel, the handwriting on the wall, they saw a hand, and it, it scared them because they're going to lose the empire. Here we see this with the, the finger of God. We know uh, in Exodus 31, when the law was given, the Bible said it was the finger of God. We see this several times. Later, Moses describing the giving of the law the second time in Deuteronomy, it was the finger of God. And we see the finger of God quite often. Um, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, there's an episode where Jesus is casting out a demon. And he's talking about the comparison of Beelzebub and the Lord and his power. And, of course, he, he there, uh, he heals a deaf and, and dumb man. And there's a discussion there that Jesus is having and I thought about the demonic possession. And, and today we have a lot, of, a lot of things going on in our world. I, I believe in third world countries where there's a lot more drugs and a lot more mental illness that's untreated. There's a lot more demon possession. I've seen things on the mission field. Uh, Lloyd's son I had an experience uh, where he had a man saved and the man was dry heaving as though there were demons coming out of him. And I've seen things in Panama with Lisa, a lady in our church, who disrupted every service walking around the church. Now, one time I spoke on demonic possession. She threw a, threw a songbook at me and charged it and threw a microphone at me, and my deacons had to get her out of the building. She came for months, and everyone was scared of her. We had people quit our church because of her. She was so distracting. Yet I told you the rest of that story. She got saved, eventually became our nursery worker. And what a miracle there. But she did so many things, we felt there was demonic possession. And you say, well, how did you deal with it? Well, the only way to deal with demonic possession is to see someone come to Christ. There's no such thing as exorcism and holy water. I said one time, the only holy water is the water that flowed from Jesus' side. It's not holy water. We have to see people saved and because greater is he that is in you. And when someone repents and trusts Jesus Christ, we know it takes a lot of prayer to help someone who's possessed by a devil to get to that place where they repent. But God can help with that and prepare their heart and save them. And guess who moves inside? The Holy Spirit. But <clears throat> Jesus is talking about that. I, you know, I... Um, I was talking to a preacher friend of mine. I, I had several notes here written down about little things that bug me. As a Bible teacher and pastor, having taught hermeneutics and homiletics, it, it bothers me to hear things, and I hear things on the radio. Heard a guy the other day on the radio talking about there's 153 fish. He said, that's because, and he, he went into this, there were 103 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. And they were asking about that, and I thought, well, no, there weren't. There, today, there's 20-some species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. Let me just say this to you. When the Bible says something, there's not always a secret hidden meaning. Sometimes God just speaks to us bluntly, straight to the point. So what's the significance of 153 fish, fish pastor? Another person said, well, there were 153 languages in, in the world at that time. No, there weren't. So what's the significance? I think just that there were a lot of fish. It was a great miracle, and they counted them because they couldn't believe how many there were. I remember my dad came home one time. He had taken my two brothers perch fishing on the pier in Lake Michigan and caught 100-plus perch. 
And in those days, we didn't flay them. We just, you know, we, you, know you know the rest of the story. And, and I remember we always enjoyed frying them. My mother didn't enjoy frying fish. But <clears throat> what a great catch it was. And I didn't go, and I was kind of frustrated. Well, when I went, I just played down in the rocks alongside of the pier, and I didn't fish, you know. But <clears throat> they just caught all these fish, and they counted them. That's the significance of 153 fish, just a lot of fish. And so when God's word says something, just accept what it says. Sometimes, maybe there's a hidden message, but usually God just gets to the point. For instance, and I shared this with my, my friend also, um, you know, the water and blood flowing out of Jesus' side. I've heard people say, well, the blood washed away the sin and the water, the stain of sin, but I don't find that in the Bible. I think the blood took care of it all. You see, there's a, I wrote down this in my notes. There's a scientific condition called pericardial and pleurocardial effusion. Effusion, which is when you've been through a lot of stress and Jesus had been beaten and then nails driven in his hands and a, and, and, and a crown of thorns, that water gets all around your lungs and heart. So when they ran that sword through his side, that water poured out. It's a physical fact. And Dr. Luke, tells us about that, and I don't believe you have to come up with a saying, while that makes for great preaching, I don't see that in the Bible, and I struggle with that sometimes. I want to see it in the Bible, and if you can show me where it says the water washed away sin, I'd like to see that, or the stain. I just believe the blood took care of all of it. Amen. The stain and the sin. The past, amen, my past is gone. Your past is gone. I have to press towards the mark. And so I shared you some things, little things that bug me. <laughs> and I don't know if I needed to add that segment, but we know that the finger of God is seen often. And in my life, I've seen the finger of God. There's been so many things I've seen God manipulate with his hand or his fingers, even though he's a spirit. Riding at a checkpoint in Panama after they'd killed an American. And my wife and I didn't live on base, and we would ride at a Panamanian checkpoint. And the AK-47s are pointed at us, and we're thinking Mary's holding a baby. We had one baby at the time, or no, maybe two. I don't remember. Who knows? But, uh, and I told people I had four boys, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, and Joe. They said, what happened to Mo? There ain't going to be no Mo, I said. <laughs> and we're here, and, and we're, we're, you know, a little bit nervous because we're warned. And then a guy walks up says, I know these people. I played volleyball with them in downtown Cologne. He's speaking in Spanish. And he said, he's a padre, a father of a holy church in Spanish. And the guy said, go ahead. And I thought, whew. Finger of God, you know? It was a God thing. It was a God thing. And you've heard the story before. I told this a year ago. When we moved out of our apartment into a double-wide mobile home, and a bomb blew up our dining room and bullets riddled my bookshelves. In your life, you could tell a story, couldn't you? Where you said, God has definitely had his hand on my life. He's manipulated things because he is sovereign. Sovereign. You get that? He's in control. Our world's messed up. He knows what he's doing. Just like Nebuchadnezzar was a puppet in God's hand, so are our country's leaders puppets in the hand of God. And he can do whatever he wants. And I take confidence in it. Anyway, I've gotten way off, but I told you I was going to deviate a little bit today. Didn't want to be too redundant. But in John chapter 8 and verse 6, he uses his finger, doesn't he? You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? You remember the story since I start. They brought a woman to Jesus caught in the very act of adultery. And they threw her down at his feet. And they said, the law is to stone her. And Jesus said, he who hath the first, or he who hath no fault, throw the first stone or rock at her. Nobody could pick up a stone. And then he wrote something on the ground. And Second Opinions is not an inspired book in the Bible. I've heard great preaching on that that I didn't know if it was necessarily true. Because the bottom line is we don't know what he wrote on the ground, do we? So don't preach or teach that with authority. We don't know. I have suspicions. Maybe he wrote the guilty man's name. I don't know. Maybe he wrote the 
The commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't know what he did. But Jesus wrote, and back in Luke, when he dealt with a demon-possessed man, he called it the finger of God. And we see the Son of Man in all of this. The Son of Man is the greatest title for Jesus, remember. That's God in the flesh. That's greater than the, the Son of God. The Son of Man is the greatest title. The demons called him the Son of God, but they never called him the Son of Man because that would fulfill all the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. Daniel and Ezekiel, I think a hundred times, calls him the Son of Man. So here he writes on the ground with his finger. And here the magician said, we can't do this. This is a finger of God. In other words, God is powerful enough, but our Egyptian God of the desert, whose name was Set, and demanded perfectly clean worship, couldn't be worshipped because everybody's filthy, covered in lice. And when they wanted to get cleaned up so they could worship their God, they couldn't. And they couldn't create fleas, and they couldn't get rid of them, obviously, like the other plagues, unless God decided they'd end. And so we've got a mess here. Again, showing that God is in control. He's sovereign. I think of the little things in, in our lives. Uh, patience is a necessary and crowning virtue. The Bible talks about adding patience. And it's like a choreograph, like a conductor in a choir would add a bass. I know Sister Joy has uh, been so faithful, and we're always going to have Sister Joy. Uh, but she's going to have her leg fixed, and, and one time we're going to have to find a substitute for Sister Joy. God will provide. She's awesome. We're so thankful for you and your faithfulness. And uh, she'll be our piano player for the next 20 years. Her mother lived to be, you know, 100. So anyway, my point is this. To add to the choir a bass singer or a piano player or whatever we add... That's the word over there, the same word choreograph in the New Testament where it said add and add and add. And the crowning thing is patience. You know what, where you are as a Christian, whether or not you have patience. If you're a very patient person, that's a good sign because that's the final one you add. It's the crowning achievement of the Christian walk. And I'm not there yet. I can still get annoyed, still be impatient. What about the little things in your life? Had a family come to me a while back, years, year, this years ago, and their children were just out of control. They were new Christian people in the church, and I thought, oh, I hope they come to me about rearing children. And they did. And I just was so thrilled to be able to say, you need to discipline your children. <laughs> it seems like a little thing, but if you don't discipline them early, the Bible says, you're going to have a teenager that's out of control. It's just a little thing, a spanking, discipline. But it can really make a big difference. And I've always said encouraging your children is just a little thing, but, but it's a huge thing, isn't it? I know that I, I heard a long time ago, and I, I, maybe I coined the phrase, maybe I came up, up with it, but if you don't hug your daughter, some other jerk's going to. Take your daughters by the side and give them a hug. Touch is so important from a parent's perspective. Other than spanking them all the time, touch is important. A little thing. A little thing. And a little thing like confessing your sin on a regular basis every day, saying, God, is so important. Your, your devotional time, reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture, little things matter. And if you're not doing the little things Scripture asks you to do, don't expect the big things. God wants you faithful in the little things. And then he'll trust you with more things and bigger things. Doesn't it clearly teach that in the church age, if we're faithful in the coming kingdom, you know, we'll, we'll be entrusted with more authority, more responsibility? I love that. And after that kingdom, I love the new Jerusalem is going to come down after the millennial kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth. Are you faithful in the little things? First of all, do you know the Lord is your Savior? If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, I, I would come forward and just say, Pastor, I don't know the Lord, and I'll, I'll take the Scripture or someone will and show you how to become a Christian. 
Maybe you've been just playing that part and you're a great actor because you pretended to be a Christian for years and years and you're not. And maybe in recent years or recent days or months, the Lord's spoken to you and said, you've never truly been born again. It, I don't necessarily agree with Billy Graham's assessment that half the people in church are lost. But what if that is the case? I wouldn't be one of those guys. I'd say, you know, I've never repented. And I want to repent and be saved. God's convicted me about my sin. And I want to call on the Lord Jesus. D.L. Moody said something one time. I loved it. He said, when someone steps out in the aisle to come forward and be saved, he said, they're already saved. When in their heart they said, I need to be saved. And I'm going, I'm going forward to get confirmation or to pray a prayer or to tell a preacher to get baptized. Listen, trust the Lord with your heart. He'll never fail you. All the failures will be because of the world, the flesh, the devil, your own self, but not because of God. God never fails because he is the all-powerful God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. And Lord, I don't know the hearts here, but you do. Maybe someone here is plagued by something small. Maybe today they want prayer. They can come and we'll pray with them. Maybe today someone is here who uh, has a sin problem. Uh, maybe they're not saved. I don't know the hearts, but I just pray, Lord, you work as you always promise. Your words never void. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Amen.